and welcome to another episode of Public Health Matters with the Uncas Health District. I'm your host, Patrick McCormick, and we have another great guest today. We have Derek May, and Derek wears about, what, 10, 15, 20 different hats, all around emergency preparedness. And September is National Preparedness Month, uh, so we thought no better person to bring to, to visit us today than somebody who does every single thing there possibly is in preparedness activities. So welcome, Derek, and thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, anytime. Yeah. <laughs> and wearing any of your hats. Sure. Um, so starting by saying Derek is with the Northeast District Department of Health, Derek is with the Eastern Highlands Health District, and Derek is with the Pomfret Volunteer Fire Department. Mm -hmm. Derek is with the American Red Cross. Anything else I'm leaving out? Emergency Management Director in Pomfret, um, Amateur Radio Emergency Services, and a few other things too. You're like a Swiss Army knife, you cover everything. Once you get started, the inertia kind of keeps you going. Once you pop, you just can't stop? Maybe. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about what emergency um, response organizations um, you got involved in and why. Um, so more of the volunteer activities, I guess, to start. Sure. Um, I guess kind of growing up in, uh, I grew up in Woodstock, Connecticut, which is a small rural town, as you know. And uh, there's a spirit of volunteerism there because you're kind of kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So um, you have to get along with your neighbors. You have to do things for each other. So growing up seeing that, um, I always knew there was a need to uh, kind of give back. Mm -hmm. I think in my 20s, I took an opportunity. I didn't lean towards emergency response right away. I uh, took a volunteer opportunity in Alaska Parks oh, wow. for six months and I built trails up there and that was really neat. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, you know, for the whole summer I think they gave us a hundred dollar stipend or something like that. So, so you have to like the work because it wasn't for the money. It was a great <laughs> experience, uh, you know, and they paid me a hundred bucks. So that was, <laughs> that was not too bad. And then um, in my thirties, uh, I kind of settled down, um, bought a house in Pomfret with my wife and we were starting a family and um, heard a fire truck go by one day when I was out um, in the backyard and I thought, you know, I, they probably could use some help. Mm -hmm. So um, I got involved with the Pomfret Fire Department and then um, that was kind of my introduction to emergency services. Um, of course, once you become a firefighter, then you uh, get into emergency medical services. Mm -hmm. So I became an EMR, then an EMT. Um, we had an ambulance at that time, so um, got to drive the ambulance and work in the back of the ambulance, see a lot of patients. And then being in that realm, um, when the town needed an uh, emergency management director, yeah. um, I said I can help out with that. And um, even with all those hats on, I kind of, uh, after Hurricane Katrina happened in 2005, we weren't called, mm -hmm. you know. Um, right. And I thought back to 2001 when uh, the, the September attacks had occurred and I was in a fire department, uh, but we weren't called. And in 2005, I said, well, I gotta get involved in something else so I can be involved in the next non-local thing. So I joined the Red Cross. Um, in 2006, I went out to uh, California wildfires with that. And um, last year I deployed to uh, Texas for the, uh, the hurricane relief there with the Red Cross. And you did take a little tour of California at that point too, didn't you? Didn't you have to take a little ride? Yeah, we thought <laughs> we were gonna come straight home from Texas, um, but then it turned out that the uh, wildfires in California last year, just like this year, just like every year, flared up again and um, I ended up driving one of the Red Cross trucks uh, called Irv's all the way uh, from Texas to Sacramento, which was, Different. Never done that before. <laughs> so when so when you do all of these activities, is there an assumption that you're just going to hit the ground running, or is there an understanding that there's probably going to be a great deal of training involved before you can really start doing the work? Yeah, it's great to have um, to just step up and say, "Here I am, use me." Right. But uh, having been on the other side of that, on the managerial side of it, if I, if somebody steps up to help me. Um, as a group leader and they say, I want to help. Well, I don't know them. I don't know their skills. I don't know um, what they can do, what they can't do. So it's very tough to, to get things rolling. So by getting involved early in other organizations, I felt I've made myself a, a, 
more uh, prepared volunteer so I can really bring the skills that that group is looking for and um, hopefully can provide better service to that organization no matter what it is. Yeah. So you've been involved uh, a great deal obviously through the fire department um, through your role in the local health departments in terms of recruitment mm -hmm. and you and I had, had a discussion off camera about um, you know, being the fire chief you're responsible to manage the folks that are going to respond sure. and yet you always have that fear that they're never going to be there. Um, so maybe you could speak a little bit to how you recruit people and how you recruit the right people to make sure that they're going to be engaged enough to respond when there's an emergency. Sure. So uh, in my, uh, my day job, my, my paying job with uh, the health departments, I um, lead the medical reserve corps of each one of those um, health districts. And, and that's so North, Northeast District Department of Health out of? Uh, out of Brooklyn, yeah. and then Eastern Highlands Health District out of Mansfield. Yeah. So about 20 towns in all. Uh, and in those towns, um, we look for medical and non-medical volunteers who could help with the Medical Reserve Corps. It's a, um, it's a part of Citizen Corps, it's a national group, and basically it's um, public health volunteers. Mm -hmm. So if public health had to respond to some sort of uh, emergency, or assist with a larger with the public health aspects of a uh, of an emergency, we'd need extra folks. Right. We've only got um, you know 20 people, uh, two dozen people between both health districts. So uh, to have volunteers who are um, known, um, trained, and organized ahead of time, that's a tremendous advantage and a real force multiplier when it comes to addressing a situation that pops up that. Uh, that needs some some help. And tell me the kind of responses that you have been involved in or the ones you anticipate that somebody may actually have to be involved in. Sure. So with the Medical Reserve Corps um, and public health, we really have a public health as a lead role in something like a pandemic mm -hmm. um, or in providing a lot of medication to a lot of people very quickly. Other times the event is not going to be public health centric. Think of a uh, tornado. Um, public health probably is not going to lead the response to a tornado. Probably emergency, ma emergency management is. Right. Um, fire departments are going to play a role in that. Uh, emergency medical service is going to play a role. And also public health is going to play a role because um, in any kind of a big weather event like that you're going to get um, interruption to uh, roads, power, uh, communication, uh, clean water, clean access to food, access to health care. Um, and those are all places where um, public health can really play a role. And again, Medical Reserve Corps can help provide that. We've done uh, a lot of practice runs. We've done a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we plan for in response to a, a pandemic or a, a, even a, a bioterror attack or something is to get medication out quickly. And so we've held exercises to test our uh, mass dispensing plans, mass medication dispensing plans. And we've done that both in the form of a, uh, a venue like a school where people would come and get their uh, medication, pick it up, and then of course you have to have volunteers or staff uh, provide it to them. They have to get the right stuff. They have to get the right information along with it. And then we've also done some drive-through uh, pods uh, points of dispensing, and those are simply set up in a um, parking lot of a school or a mall or any available space and quickly set up a traffic pattern where people can again come in, get a little information, um, get the right medication that they need, and, and then be on their way as fast as possible so that we can continue giving um, those supplies to, to other folks. Well, and you always hear the people comment at those type of clinics, you know, this is great, I, I yeah. have mobility issues, I never thought that somebody would allow me to just pull up and hang my arm out the window. Right. Other people say if I'm sick and I'm, or I'm, I'm not sick and I'm going to an event and I'm around all these people that are sick, how does that make any sense? So right. it seems like that type of an event would, would fill that role. Yeah, um, there's definitely a, a role for walk-through pods uh, and, and a lot of times uh, in a larger city like Hartford or something where you've got a lot of people concentrated in a small area and you've got uh, some pretty big um, 
venues, some big buildings to work with. Mm -hmm. That works very well. Where I work in Northeast Connecticut, it's um, not everybody has a car, but most people have access to cars because we have to. So allowing people to drive in, um, get what they need, and and leave without even getting out of their car is great for for folks who um, move a little slower. Right. Uh, for folks who can't, maybe they can leave their kids in the car mm -hmm. at this. They don't have to leave their uh, their children elsewhere. And um, so it's it's turned out to be one good method that we'll combine with other methods and hopefully it'll, we'll never have to use it in the real thing. Yeah, well, and, that, and that's, you know, I was going to ask you about the, the relationships you have with different either um, organizations, uh, you know, facilities. Um, how do you need to plan that out in terms of, you know, there's the paperwork, mm -hmm. but then there's also the functional piece of it, which, you know, I know you've had great relationships with things like um, uh, school facilities people and mm -hmm. Uh, you know, people that are in the community that are willing to offer space, and that's something that, you know, people don't think about. Right. However, you know, without a good appropriate space, there's no way you can make something like that happen. Yeah, and the same way that um, public health plays a support role uh, in a larger emergency, this is a, a type of a role that we can prepare for. We can prepare our section of it. So if a volunteer is better prepared by planning ahead of time, same way the health department is better prepared by planning ahead of time and establishing relationships with the schools, uh, relationships with volunteers, relationships with uh, fire, EMS partners, emergency management partners. And so if you uh, have worked with these folks right along, you've planned with them right along, when the event comes, right. you all know each other, you know each other's um, strengths and um, how to work together better, essentially. Now, one of the, the toughest parts I know for myself, and I'm sure it's for every volunteer, is uh, the call goes out, we need your help. Uh, but, you know, in our case, you know, somebody will call and say, you know, you're going to have to respond to an emergency operations center, mm -hmm. um, you know, bring your bags, uh, bring something to eat, and a plan to be here for a while. So you're leaving your family behind, knowing that there's potentially they're going to have no power, they're going to be right. you know, limited to food. Um, you know, all the things you worry about for your family, and yet you're leaving your family to go and help other people. So how do you kind of come to terms with that as either a leader or as a volunteer? Well, my experience as a volunteer, is, I hope, has uh, made me a better leader because if you're always um, involved in an organization at the bottom level or at a lower rung, you remember what it's like to be ordered around, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's necessary. So um, one of the things about being a volunteer is to have a balance. It's great to be part of, a many, of many groups, but I think the, the things that are most important when it comes to um, volunteering and, and working with your, your workplace and your family is, is communication. Mm -hmm. uh, have everybody on the same page uh, about what's going to happen. Um, communicate expectations. Uh, whether it's with your workplace or your spouse, mm -hmm. certainly with your spouse. <laughs> um, you don't really make any friends at home by leaving uh, your spouse with a screaming six-month-old and say, I've got to leave because somebody needs me somewhere. Mm -hmm. right. That, that if, doesn't go over too well. Exactly, right. exactly. Um, and the same with your workplace. Um, when I uh, worked with a different company about 10 years ago, um, I went to them, the boss, and I said, look, I joined up to be a part of a wildfire crew to go out west. How do you feel about me getting a call one day and then uh, being gone for two weeks? Mm -hmm. And he thought about it. He says, well, um, I'm okay with it. I'm not going to pay you, um, but you can use vacation time. Mm -hmm. I said, well, all right. I mean, that's uh, maybe not the ideal. Right. Uh, but it was okay, and it was certainly good enough, and we knew where each other stood when the call did come in, and I was gone the next day, and there was no, uh, uh, it just worked out fine. That's the same type of thing with your family. you gotta, you got to be fair and balance out where you need to be and uh, keep the most important things to you first. You know, keep, keep your family first, your workplace, and then uh, if you can help out neighbors or, or other folks, that's great. So we, so we talked a little bit about the Medical Reserve Corps. 
um, and you alluded to the fact that you're in two different places. Um, if somebody wanted to sign up for the Medical Reserve Corps, do they need to find Derek May at the Northeast District Department of Health, or is there another way they can go about signing up? That's a great way to do it. Uh, that's probably the most simple way. Just have them contact me, and we'd love to have folks who are interested in volunteering. Again, uh, retired medical is great. Right. Um, current medical has got a little extra time. That's great. But if you're not medical, um, we could absolutely use you. I had one uh, person show up to one of our first MRC sessions, and she said, I don't know really why I'm here. I don't have any background in this. And I said, what do you do? She said, oh, I'm a, I'm, I work at a bank. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, God, you can work with numbers, and you're trusted with money. I'm thinking <laughs> in the back of my yeah. head. It's like, this is an excellent person that we need for administration of of anything that's going to happen. Right. So, um, you know, she's worth her weight in gold just as much as, as the, the nurse or doctor. Um, so they can contact me at, at NDDH, um, and the, I believe my information will be posted. It's dmay at nddh.org. It's right up there now. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll be able to get you in contact with the right folks, even if it's not me, because I work with uh, a lot of other health districts, like Uncas Health District and other emergency management agencies and, and uh, partner groups. So if you have an interest um, and I'm the contact information you got, I'll get you where you need to go. How about that? That's great. <laughs> and I know, you know, that's one of the things that I think sometimes we forget is that people are um, transient now. Um, so you may be at college for part of the year right. and then you're home somewhere else in the, in the summertime. Um, you may work in the northeast section, but you may be living in the southeast section. Right. So um, is the best thing for them to reach out to you and just sort of explain their situation? You'll sure. figure out the best fit? Yeah, absolutely, because every person has their own um, path, mm -hmm. and sometimes you just got to kind of talk through that and say, this is what I've got. I want to give. Right. What's the best thing to do? And I've told folks... Uh, you know, if you're very interested in volunteering, especially in emergency response, um, you want to do something every day, go to your local fire department um, or local EMS agency because 75% of uh, fire departments in America are still volunteer, yeah. and there's certainly a lot in our area. Um, so they're looking for your help every day, and they will appreciate the heck out of you. If you want to do something every week, every month. The American Red Cross is great, especially in eastern Connecticut here. Um, they go to house fires after a, a home is, has burned. They'll go and work with the folks, get them through the next couple rough days while they're getting back up on their feet. You can deploy across the country um, for a couple weeks at a time if that fits. Sometimes it doesn't. That's fine. Um, or you could do something administrative, like they're always looking for help with blood drives. Mm -hmm. um, just somebody to check folks in. And, um, and, and help in that aspect. There's plenty of things you can do on a you know, weekly or monthly basis. And I think um, if you want to do things a few times a year, maybe stay on a list, uh, say, call me if you need me. Um, and I'm, I want to do a lot of trainings and stuff. Uh, Medical Reserve Corps is a great way to go. We don't pester people too much. Right. It's a way to help in your local communities, the way our local units work. We're very... Um, Community centric. We're very. Um, we work in the towns that we live in. Um, your CERT team is another possibility, or you could get in touch with your emergency management director. So, so tell me, what does CERT stand for? Okay, CERT is uh, Community Emergency Response Team. And what is that? Um, it's a partner organization to the Medical Reserve Corps. They both fall under Citizen Corps, which all falls under um, Homeland Security nationally. Um, CERT is uh, very much like the MRC, except that there is a set curriculum. And when you see the curriculum, it's very based out of um, earthquake country. Okay. It's a little bit of first aid. Um, it's about 20, 25 hours of training, a little bit of first aid, a little bit of disaster preparedness, uh, personal preparedness, a little bit of shoring up buildings or assessing buildings that might be da too damaged to go into. Yep. Um, I'm a CERT instructor, so I've taught a few classes, and it really is a great program. So anytime I hear of one, I try to advertise it out to my Medical Reserve Corps units and say, hey, you're, I know you're MRC, mm -hmm. but if you've got the time, um, take CERT training too, because um, 
that is one of the things I've really enjoyed about being a volunteer is uh, I love to learn. Yeah. I don't like not knowing things. Um, so when you get involved in an organization, usually the training is free, in fact, almost always. And you can do a lot of really neat stuff um, just to give your time. Well, you I know? guess that would be my question is uh, the work that you've done as a volunteer, mm -hmm. has it given you, given you an increased um, sense of, of safety because you know what's out there in terms of um, uh, you know, programs and plans and all the exercises, or are you terrified because you know how limited <laughs> the resources are and you're worried, you know, if, if something happens, would we be able to respond to that emergency? Well, it's the blend. Okay. Um, I feel more prepared with the skills that I've got. Um, so you could save yourself. In the <laughs> I can save myself, yeah. my family, and maybe neighbor, I hope. Yeah. Um, and I've, in my uh, before I get involved in this, in my 20s, I came across a few accidents, as everybody does, and I really didn't know what to do, and I, I really was kind of useless, and mm -hmm. uh, I didn't like that. Um, since then, I've had accidents I've come across, just as a person driving around, I've been able to help. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on a plane last year, and somebody fell very ill, and just like in the movies, they come over the intercom, and they say, anybody with medical experience, uh, Please, you know, please see the flight attendant. And so I was able to help there, and um, I couldn't have done that without the training I'd gotten. Um, you would have been George Costanza, the marine biologist, right? <laughs> 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 you, you can make your way through some stuff, but not through everything. Yeah, it's not everything. So I feel more prepared with the training that I've got, and um, with the knowledge that I have about the plans that are in place, I, I appreciate the response organizations that are out there. I'm right. part of some of them, but I can also see how inadequate, um, you can't plan for everything, yep. and you can only plan with the people who are paying attention at that moment. Uh, <clears throat> if we've got something that affects 88,000 people or 160,000 people, it depends on where you're at, um, that's gonna take more than the everyday responders we've got. They're gonna be full up. Um, with work. So if we can get uh, more people involved uh, and familiar with the plans that are in place, we can really flesh those out and, and we can do some good work and do some is, healing. Is there a lot of overlap with people that are volunteering? So they're, you know, they're, to your point, you know, the way yeah. you're doing things, you know, you're volunteering in multiple places and then how do they prioritize or how do the volunteer organizations know when they're going to be able to respond to them because if you're volunteering for five different places yep. you can't be in all places at once. Right and that's um, something I thought of as far as I have multiple affiliations and I I think that's good and I encourage everybody to be uh, affiliated with multiple organizations if they're in this type of thing because you get different skill sets and different trainings right. and different capacities to respond with each group but um, you got to go back to what I said about uh, being fair and communicating too and setting expectations. Right. So I do worry that I, I might be counted five times with five different organizations, mm -hmm. but as long as, I, uh, as long as they know that yeah. and I know that and um, we're all on the same page, it should be all right. And I'm, I'm very, uh, try to be very clear too that whoever I respond with, that's who I'm with at that moment. Right. I'm not going to try to do all five things at once. It just doesn't work. Uh, so that's what I would say with any volunteers. If, if there is somebody being double counted, just let know whatever. Let the organization know. Say yes, I'm um, I'm joining you, but I'm also um, part of a faith-based based group that, that works in disasters, mm -hmm. or I'm uh, I work at a hospital. So if such and such hospital is affected, I might not be available. And that's the nature of the game. The, the volunteers, um, you're never going to get everybody available at all the same time. Um, so you just uh, work with who you've got, and people will be more or less available at different times of their lives, and that's okay. So if you do your part by, if a volunteer does their part by stepping forward and saying, um, here I am, here's the skills I've got, and here's my availability, um, I'll tell them, all right, stay tuned, right. and uh, we welcome you.
<laughs> so, so we have about four minutes left. Sure. So I wanted to get two last questions in. Um, first one is the behavioral health component. Um, I know you and I have had a lot of connection with mm -hmm. behavioral health folks, and uh, probably in the last 10 years, there's been a, a definite um, recognition of behavioral health when we have yeah. these type of events. Um, can you just explain quickly how you've uh, connected with behavioral health around some of the work that you've done, especially around the Medical Reserve Corps? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, behavioral health it used to be known as mental health. Um, it's a, uh, let's see, how did Jeff you just used to describe it? It's a normal response to an abnormal situation. Right. So if you've got a pandemic going on and we're giving out medication, there are going to people, be people who, who show up who are uh, nervous about that situation. Or if a tornado has gone through and somebody's uh, coming to a shelter, they're going to be uh, upset. And that makes sense because right. their world's been turned upside down. And it could be my world that got turned upside down by the tornado. So recognizing that and incorporating behavioral health uh, into responses makes a lot of sense. Uh, Medical Reserve Corps offers and promotes classes called psychological first aid. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to be a counselor to provide psychological first aid or uh, behavioral health intervention. Sometimes it's just recognizing that somebody's um, looking out of sorts, agitated, and just saying, how are you doing? Right. And, um, or bringing them a bottle of water. You know, when's the last time you ate? You know, and I remember one, one incident was uh, somebody's looking very nervous, and well, th what they needed to was to step out of the line and use the restroom, but they didn't want to lose their spot. Right. So it doesn't take a counselor to hold their spot in line. They just needed somebody to talk to. Now the, the last question I have in the last couple minutes here is sure. um, there's been an evolution obviously of preparedness over the years. You know, mm -hmm. We talk about 9-11, um, you know, the, the now incident command um, staffing that you have in an event, um, you know, the ability to communicate better using equipment or, um, you know, verbiage that now is consistent from place to place. Mm -hmm. How have you seen things evolve in your time of preparedness and where do you think things will be going in the future? Um. So I've been doing this about 11 years now. I've seen um, the preparedness messaging hone um, down within, uh, become common between multiple organizations, between the Red Cross and FEMA and Homeland Security. So everybody should be prepared for at least three days okay. on their own. Um, and that means be able to take care of yourself, your family, and maybe a neighbor for, for three days or so. That doesn't mean people aren't going to be trying to help you. Right. Just everything is uh, could be a catastrophic event is going to overwhelm everybody. And um, so you need to do as much as you can to do your part for yourself. Um, so another message that's out there though is uh, get a kit, stay informed, uh, make a plan, and get involved. Okay. So get a kit, have your four big things I call them, water, food, flashlight, radio and um, medication if you need it. That's the fifth thing. Kids toys, whatever that fifth thing is that you need, make sure you have that. Um, have a plan of what you're going to do if communications go down or power goes down. Um, get involved with some of these organizations that we've talked about and then be informed. Get a credible source of information. AM radio is great. Mm -hmm. FM radio is great if it's giving you local information. It works when the power is off. You just have to have batteries in the radio. You got to make sure the batteries work too. So well, that's a uh, great a great way to wind up. Okay. Um, you know, certainly we have uh, great resources in the region. Um, I just want you to give your contact information one more time so people can reach Derek. Sure. So my name's Derek May. Um, I'm with the Northeast District Department of Health. Email is the best way, probably d m a y at n d d h dot org. And uh, if you need to call the office, 860-774-7350. Or just have an emergency and Derek will show up. Well, <laughs> let's try to avoid that. But thank you, though. All right. So thank you very much, Derek, sure. for being with us today. Uh, we will see you again on another episode of Public Health Matters with the Uncas Health District. And happy National Preparedness Month in September. We'll see you next time.